evening, we have a panel that, that will be uh, discussing the topic this evening, and it will be hosted by Dr. Richard Mazabedi from Botswana International University of Science and Technology. And a special thank you to Richard, as he is really um, an expert on the Okavango and the systems and hydrology of the Okavango himself, and thus far better suited to uh, facilitate the session than any one of us would be. So we really appreciate his time as well. And at this point, I am going to hand over to him. So with any, without any further ado, let's head over to the Okavango. Thank you, Johan, and uh, good evening to um, everyone. And um, I hope we will enjoy um, today's session. Um, it's a privilege to be the host, and uh, thank you for the opportunity. So I will start off with um, introducing um, our speakers, and I will introduce them in the way that they are going to present. Um, we have uh, Dr. Surina Estahus, and uh, she focuses on protecting water resources during fracking. She co-edited the book, Hydraulic Fra uh, Fra Fracturing in the Garu, Critical and Legal Perspectives and uh, co-authored the Strategic Environmental Assessment for Shale Gas in the Karoo. Her current research focuses on various aspects of the regulation of fracking to protect groundwater resources. We also have uh, Anton Lucas. Anton Lucas is a PhD candidate and a research assistant at the Institute for Groundwater Studies of the University of Free state, utilizing a strong background in structural geology and hydrogeology. Anton's research is primarily focused on the numerical modeling of fractured hard rock aquifers, aquifer test analysis, and the application of machine learning to advance groundwater science and practice. <clears throat> and then we, we have Rory Sheldon. Rory Sheldon is an ecologist from Botswana with experience in conservation management and governance, community support and development, ecotourism, and scientific journalism. He is dedicated to protecting and rewilding natural ecosystems through sustainable and traditional practices that alleviate poverty while beneficiating local communities and indigenous people. So with that introduction, um, the floor is yours, uh, uh, Serena, Anthony, and Anton, and uh, Rory. Thank you. Um, thank you, Richard. So I'm going to start the introduction of this panel presentation, uh, and I'm going to give an overview of the Okavango water resources, the river systems, as well as the different types of oil and gas extraction that you can get, and the general impacts of this on water resources. And after that, Anton will take over from me. Okay, so first I want to discuss um, a general map of the area. The um, Kibango Okavango River Basin uh, covers approximately 34,000 square kilometers, while the larger Okavango River Basin covers an area of approximately 700,000 square kilometers. It encompasses rivers across Namibia, Botswana, and um, Angola. And the Keto and Kubango rivers run across Angola and originate in the Angolan Highlands and eventually join the Okavango River on the border between Namibia and Angola and Botswana. From there, the Okavango River runs into the Okavango Delta. The Okavango River sustains more than half a million people across uh, Namibia and Botswana, while the Okavango Delta is one of the largest freshwater wetlands in Southern Africa. It has been declared a World Heritage Site and it sustains over 1,000 plant species, 480 bird species and 130 species of mammals. It is also one of the largest sources of tourism income in Botswana. So this illustrates the importance of the Okavango River system. Okay, so I just here on this slide want to illustrate the extent of oil and gas extraction across Namibia and Botswana. 
This map shows uh, data from the Botswana Mining Cadaster and Namibia Ministry of Mining and Energy. And the purple areas indicate the current oil and gas extraction exploration licenses that are active, while the gray areas indicate over here and over here exploration licenses that are pending. You will see that these, area, these exploration licenses cover large areas of Namibia and Botswana. And what's important to note from this is that if all these exploration licenses are granted and eventually if oil and gas is extracted from these areas, that the resultant impact on water resources could be regional and cumulative. This means that individual EIAs that are done for each specific license application will not consider and illustrate the significant cumulative and regional risk that these extraction activities may pose. What is important about this slide is to note that in the southern part of Botswana and Namibia, there is current oil and gas uh, exploration in Namibia, which coincides with the Galagadi Transfrontier Park and also with the Stump Creek Transboundary Aquifer System. In, on the Botswana side, this license is pending. However, if these licenses are approved and eventually oil and gas is extracted from these areas, this might pose a significant risk to the um, stubborn transboundary aquifer system and also to water resources in Botswana, South Africa and Namibia. Our study focuses in, on the northern part of Namibia where current exploration licenses are active under Recon Africa where they have drilled uh, stratigraphic holes near the Imutaka River Basin, and we, they also have a pending license, they haven't started drilling there, but an active license to do exploration next to the Okavango Delta system in Botswana. This image just illustrates the different types of oil and gas extraction that you get. Um, now, oil has become significant at the end of World War II, when significant conventional deposits were found in the Middle East. And since then, oil has played a significant role in the development of energy across the world. Now, oil and gas occur in two different types, firstly as conventional and then also as unconventional. The oil and gas extraction type that has traditionally been extracted since the 1960s has been conventional oil and gas. And on the right-hand image of the slide, you can see an example of conventional oil and gas extraction. Now, this type of oil and gas occur in a porous geological formation underneath a geological track. And the oil and gas that's present in this formation has migrated from a source rock such as a shale layer. Because of the impermeable geological layer, this oil and gas cannot migrate further to the surface and is trapped in place. If a borehole was drilled into this formation, you would then release the oil and gas without the need to stimulate any additional um, or to do any additional stimulation to release the oil and gas. If, um, oh yeah, with the conventional resources that have been depleted over the past few years, the oil and gas companies now have to turn towards alternative resources in the form of unconventional oil and gas. And for unconventional oil and gas, you need stimulation to release the oil and gas because the, the oil and gas is trapped in um, non-permeable formations. Now you have two different types, which include shale gas and bulbic methane, as well as tight gas sands. I'm specifically going to focus on shale gas and bulbic methane, which is the focus of the Peru Basin. Now on shale, for shale gas, what you typically have to do is you have to draw a vertical borehole into the shale formation. And from there, you draw horizontal holes further into the shale formation so that you can access as much of the shale as possible. Then you do hydraulic fracturing, during which time you pump large volumes of uh, water, chemicals, and propent into the borehole and down into the shale formation under very high pressures. This fractures open the formation and releases the oil and gas to the surface. Then for um, coal seam gas, what's important to note is that in, in contrast to shale gas that may occur at depths of between two to five kilometers deep, your coal bed methane may occur at much shallower depths, say approximately 600 meters. And it's important to notice that these coal bed methane resources may co-occur with shallow freshwater aquifer systems. Now in this slide, I just want to discuss 
the general water resource impacts that may emanate from oil, oil and gas extraction. Now, if you look at conventional oil and gas resources, uh, one of the most important things is the, the, with the drilling, the drilling wastes and other wastewater that may return to the surface, that needs to be disposed of properly. If this water is not disposed of properly, it may cause contamination. So for instance, if it's stored in a pit that is not lined or the, or the liner is broken and it leaks, this may contaminate groundwater resources. Any transport of your oil you know, in pipelines, if the pipeline is compromised, this may leak into the groundwater systems. And then it's also important to note if you have enhanced oil recovery, you may need to take additional water from water resources such as groundwater and surface water, and this may lower your groundwater table and may influence the water level in your surface water resources, which may in turn affect the ecological status. Um, when you look at shale gas uh, extraction, it's important to note that in this case, uh, large volumes of chemicals is usually transported to the site that is used in developing the fracking fluids. If any of these trucks tip over, there may be chemical spillages that may contaminate the groundwater. And during the development of oil and gas extraction, when fracking water is pumped down the well and oil and gas is produced, it is possible to return large volumes of wastewater to the surface. Now this wastewater may, con may contain fracking water that's returned to the surface. It may contain produced water that is produced by the geological formation and that may be radioactive and have high salt content. And there may also be drilling waste that is returned to the surface. Now, all of this wastewater needs to be managed properly. And the typical procedures for managing this wastewater includes disposal in pits, uh, where the pits typically should be lined, after which it may be evaporated or it may be transported to a hazardous waste site if the wastes are hazardous. And in the US, this waste is also stored during deep well injection into deep geological formations. And what happens in this case is that the wastewater is pumped into the geological formation and stored underground. However, this additional water that is stored underground may cause uh, reactivation of geological features and may cause seismicity, which may in turn cause the migration of wastewaters underground. Lastly, when considering the well itself, it is possible that you might have well breaches or that the well integrity may be compromised uh, during, for instance, in areas where dolerite soils or faults may cross the well. And it is possible that in these instances, some of the fracking and wastewater that may return to the surface might actually migrate along these geological features. Lastly, uh, considering again, Disposal for fracking fluids, you need to withdraw large volumes of water, which may again be drawn, withdrawn from groundwater resources or surface water resources. And this may also affect your base flow to the rivers and your groundwater levels. When considering unconventional oil and gas in the form of coal bed methane, it's important, like I said, to note that these coal bed resources occur at much shallower depths. They may therefore co-occur with uh, aquifer systems, which means that once you stimulate these coal bed resources during deep pressurization or even by doing fracking, you might actually produce very large volumes of wastewater. And these large volumes of wastewater might again be radioactive or have high salinity. And it's really important to again, manage these resources effectively if you want to avoid any contamination of your water resources. Okay, so this slide just shows the study area that we focused on. We focused specifically on the Okavango River system, where Recon Africa is currently exploring. And the purple indicates the lease area in Namibia, while the pink indicates lease area in Botswana. And what Recon has done is they have currently drilled some boreholes in Amataka River, and they haven't started exploring already in Botswana, but uh, you will also see that this area is very sensitive. It is just next to the Kavango Delta, and you can also see the Kavango Zambezi Transfrontier Park area over here. So 
Okay, I'm now going to give over to Anton to discuss the hydrogeology and geology of the area as well as the study results. Thank you. Thanks, Anton. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm just going to give a quick background on the geology and the hydrogeology of our study area. So if you're there on the ground, uh, close to the Okavango Delta, you don't actually see much rock. Uh, instead, what we see is the Kalahari Sands, which blankets the area. The uh, only thing you see is dunes and, and the desert. And the Kalahari Sands are basically just uh, unconsolidated, weakly unconsolidated, uh, weakly consolidated sequence of sedimentary rocks that cover as you can see in this image, a very large part of Southern Africa. And if we now look at the thickness of the sediments, we notice that in the area surrounding the Okavango Delta, which is illustrated in this image by the black line, that we have significantly thicker sediments inside of the Delta and on the outskirts of the delta, we see sediments in the range of 70 to 200 meters thick. Now, this aquifer, or this unit, hosts the upper weathered unconfined aquifer. And this aquifer is the main um, aquifer, essentially, in that area. If there's anybody making use of water from balls, it generally tends to be from the shallower aquifers. Now, if we move on and we actually go underneath the sand, we find the rocks of the Karoo Supergroup. Now, the Karoo Supergroup is a dominantly sedimentary sequence that was deposited during the time of the Gondwana supercontinent. And the sedimentation ended during the breakup of Gondwana when a large amount of lava erupted over the area of Southern Africa. Now, despite there being several basins for the Kalahari, uh, for the Karoo. As you can see here, we've got the Kalahari Basin, Botswana and the main Karoo basins of Africa. The sedimentation and the stratigraphy inside of these basins are relatively similar. And that's because the main control on the, the type of sedimentation that's encountered at different times was where Gondwana was situated at specific times during history. So we started at a period when Gondwana was over the South Pole, and what we got was glaciers and ice age. After that, we had a marine environment after the ice started melting, and that slowly progressed as this inland sea is filled up to a more fluvial environment with rivers, and then later on, we had a more desert aeolian environment. Um, now, Recon Africa is Recon Africa used geophysical investigations to determine there's a part of the Kalahari Basin in specific, which contains uh, the type of rocks that you would associate with petroleum resources. Specifically, they are looking at uh, equivalent of the White Hill Formation that we found in South Africa, which is already a big target for shale gas extraction. And they want to target this specific unit because as far as their studies show, it might have been deposited under the same marine conditions as the White Hill Formation and thus uh, serves just as good a uh, target. And their two initial pilot wells indicated that is indeed the case. They confirmed the presence of the resource and they estimated its size at about 2 billion barrels of oil and 13, 30 trillion cubic feet of gas. Now, groundwater is known to occur in the Storenberg lavas, as well as the upper Storenberg formations in the Kalahari Basin. Um, due to the hard rock nature of these units, the main uh, method of flow is via fractures and structures. So we're going to take a closer look at these structures. Now, before we look at the structures itself, we first have to look at the tectonic framework because Africa is a quite active continent. And we'll see that the Okavango Graben, which is 
here illustrated in red, is situated southwest from the East African Rift system. And initially, the Okavango Graben was uh, interpreted as the southwesternmost terminus of this system. However, later studies have uh, shown that it might not be the case, and rather, it might just be an area accommodating the strain resulting from Africa being, to a certain degree, being torn apart along this rift. Now, let's take a closer look at the Graben itself. Um, now, Grabens are the result of extensional forces on the Earth's crust. Uh, crust. So imagine you're playing with a stretchy piece of dirt. And as you pull it apart from both sides, it will get thinner in the middle. Now think of that thin piece as a part of the land or as of the Earth's crust. When the Earth's crust, which is like the dome in this case, gets pulled apart, the land in the middle drops down and you've got a formation of a valley of sorts. And that is what we call the problem. Now the Earth's crust is, however, not as completely ductile as a piece of dough. So we have rocks and other parts of the crust that are brittle and hard and can break. So where we've got this extension, we have instances where the crust tears or breaks. And that is what we call the development of faults. And that you see illustrated here, with this flat surface, as this, this layer is pulled towards the sides by extensional forces, we have a development of this break. And as it's pulled apart, we see the one side slowly slipping down. Now associated with that, we also get smaller different breaks that compensate for some of the stress. Now, in this image on the right, we have an illustration of the Okobongo Graben. The Okobongo Graben is what geologists term a half graben, where the rocks primarily subside just on one limb of the system. In a conventional graben, you would have subsides on both sides as both sides of the crust are extended. Now, as you can see in this image, we've got the Okobongo Delta illustrated by the blue line. And we can see that the deepest parts of the delta is closer to the, the main fault of the Okamango problem. And we also see the as, as associated bunch of a lot smaller faults in between that splits the graben up into blocks. So, These blocks and these faults are quite active. And this we can see when we look at the historic earthquakes. And this image illustrates the historic earthquakes as well as the magnitude. Now, a lot of these earthquakes you'll notice occurs in the southwestern part, or southeastern part, sorry, of the gravel. And we've got water essentially from the overlying Okavango Delta that can percolate into these faults. And the faults, which are essentially just cracks, when the water is inside of it, it can act as a lubricant. And this reduces the stress required for one of these faults to activate and slip, resulting in what we uh, usually experience as an earthquake. So this water helps so that earthquakes happen more frequently, but the magnitude isn't as high as it would have been without water. Regardless, we still see fairly high magnitude of waste. And this is just a testament of how active these faults still are. And should be considered as always extensional to transtensional forces. So they could be the opening up of faults or cracks. But this is not the only structures in the area. What we also see is the Okavango Dyke Swamp, which is a large collection of Karoo Age Dolerite dikes that were in place during the breakup of Gundam. Uh, this impressive swamp uh, spans a region of nearly 2,000 kilometers in length and has a width of about 110 kilometers. The dikes are basically just magma that 
when Gondwana was breaking apart, it didn't reach the surface. It never got to erupt as volcanoes or as rifts. Rather, it cooled and solidified at depth. And these dikes cross-cut the prospect areas as well as the Okavango Graben and Delta. Now, why does this matter? It is commonly known that dikes such as these can act as barriers for flow of groundwater, uh, in particular for over them. Um, however, as these dikes cool, we have the formation of what we term cooling fractures along the side. And these cooling fractures tend to be highly conductive. And this is also where we tend to find groundwater resources. In South Africa, if you're in the Karoo Basin and you are drilling for water, one of your best targets is you go after a dolerite dike and you try to drill next to it. You just have to try and determine which side you think the water, the water will be on. Because if it acts like a barrier, it, you tend to see it like dam up on one side of the dike. Um, moving on. In this picture, we see one of the Okavango dikes. And we, you can clearly see that it's a very linear type of form. And you also saw that in the previous slide. And that is essentially the case because the, when the magma moves up through the crust, it follows planes of weakness. And this tends to be faults or cracks, things like so. So they fill up these faults, and that's why the dikes tend to be more or less linear. So you should, but you should also not think of it as just a line on the surface. Rather, this thing extends at depth as a plane. So you can imagine it as a book that is buried in the ground with just its spine sticking out, something in that case. And what can happen is, well, it's now intruded along these old faults. These faults can reactivate later. And that is what we see in the image on the right. Here we've got striations, that is due to rock faces moving and scratching each other from this particular dike on the left. The dike plane itself also underwent slip at some point, um, illustrating that new uh, fractures or um, openings could also form next to these stacks. Now, that pretty much paints the picture for our background. So let's move on to the results from the study. However, uh, something must be said before doing so. A scenario such as this would generally require that a numerical ground with a flow model is used to assess the, the possible threat to the Okavango Delta. However, due to the remoteness of the Okavango Delta, as well as the thick Alamari sediments obscuring uh, everything new, the surface information is quite scarce and not enough for the type of model that this would require. So our study primarily used publicly available data and analytical methods to estimate flow directions and travel times to just provide an estimate of what could theoretically happen. So by means of public data from the Department of Water Affairs in Botswana and the Ministry of Agriculture, Water and Land Reform in Namibia, data for 55 boreholes were obtained for the 2009-2010 season, which had the most complete data set. And in conjunction with digital a digital elevation model, the elevation of the boreholes and the rest water levels were used to determine the piezometric surface for the shallow aquifer, as well as from that, determine the flow directions. The results, which is illustrated in this image, indicate a groundwater divide in the Namibian lease area, with flow in the shallow groundwater system, primarily towards the Kubongo River. We have some flow towards mainland Namibia, but we have primarily a lot of flow towards the Kubongo, and we see the same to the east of the groundwater divide, with flow towards the Kubongo, the Okavongo, and then down here, we see flow towards the western flank of the Okavongo Delta. And surface water, groundwater interaction has been confirmed by 
isotope analysis on that western flank of the Okavango Delta. Now, next step was to estimate the travel times for groundwater migration from the pilot sites as well as new suggested sites towards the closest hydraulic future feature that could end up in the Okavango Delta. And this is only via the shallow sandy aquifer in the uh, Kalahari sediments. And it illustrates that the Namibian area, we've got flowed primarily towards the Kubongo with times less than 10 years for it to reach the Kubongo. In the Botswana lease area, as well as this part of Namibia, we see the flow is towards the Okavango, as well as the Delta, and we see times ranging from as low as three years up to 24 years. Now, these times are still relatively fast in a groundwater context, but we can get even faster if we look at fractures. If we consider a theoretical situation where along one of these dolerite dikes, we've got a continuous fraction that can connect our prospect area in the Northwest to the Okavango Delta in the Southeast. This is about a 320 kilometer distance. And based on values in literature for flow along Karoo dikes, we get values of about 0 0.001 meters per second up to one meters per second. And if we were to calculate how long it would take a contaminant to reach uh, from the prospect site to the delta, it could take from 10 years to as short as four days, four days and actually with a flow rate of one meter per second, which is quite high, but it is not um, out of the ordinary for dolerite dikes. If it's got a well-developed fracture system next to it, it, it's a very reasonable rate. And this illustrates that there's a, a significant probability that there could be a connection between these areas. The dolerite dikes themselves, they are all on planes of weakness that could activate in this tectonically active area. We also have the cooling fractures just associated with, with the dikes themselves. And then now we've got the interplay between the graben and its associated structures with the dolerite and its structures. Considering the pervasiveness and structures of the area, it's quite reasonable to assume that a connection could exist between these areas. And now I hand over to Rory for our current status and recommendations. Thank you very much, uh, Anton. Uh, if you could proceed to the next slide, thanks. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about the, the current project status and uh, where we currently are. Um, within Botswana, uh, we haven't seen very much on-site activity um, at all, um, with the exception of a few community visits from Recon Africa. The majority of their activity has been focused in the Kavango province of Namibia. Uh, during our study, they uh, drilled uh, two uh, drill sites, and uh, that has now been extended to about seven. Um, there had been some rumors going around that they'd run out of money, but at the end of December 2024, um, uh, Recon and the Namibian partner, the Namibian Chamber of Petroleum, Namco, uh, received an approval for an exploration lease extension. Um, this is the second renewal on their uh, lease that they've received, and it's now valid until January 2026. So this uh, renewal comes despite uh, numerous accusations of uh, Recon Africa flaunting a number of laws um, within Namibia, including uh, drilling without water permits. Um, they've uh, refused ministry officials access to the drill sites on a number of occasions. Um, there's been some illegal land seizures and illegal roads being built. And perhaps most concerningly uh, has been the fact that at their drill sites, uh, liners uh, predominantly haven't been used uh, for the waste pits. You'll remember and recall from uh, Serena speaking that um, this was a huge uh, 
indication of uh, or uh, indicated for um, groundwater contamination. We actually, if you look at this picture, um, calculated the groundwater to be somewhere between five to 10 meters below uh, ground level. Um, so that's a, already a considerable worry. Um, so they'll be moving ahead with these approvals and they've been given the permission to carry out numerous um, stratigraphic and exploration wells moving forward. And the company has claimed that uh, this will take place within the next three months or so. Uh, the renewal as such uh, gives Recon Africa a continuation of their environmental clearance certificate, which was uh, based on what we consider to be a flawed environmental impact assessment carried out by the company. This EIA was uh, predominantly a desktop study um, and no field work was actually undertaken as far as I know to assess damages, uh, potential damages to ecosystems, to biodiversity, to uh, the health and well-being of local communities. And uh, no on-ground studies were undertaken with regards to groundwater and surface water contamination. Uh, there was a groundwater element uh, of their EIA, um, uh, but uh, again, it was a desktop study. And strangely enough, uh, they actually used the exact same uh, public uh, borehole information that we used for our study, just uh, they managed to find some rather different results. So as we currently stand, there has been no transfrontier regional groundwater study within that area, nor by RECON, nor by the, 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 the governments involved. There had been a 2010 OCACOM study um, commissioned, but uh, at that time, the author uh, claimed that limited uh, geological and hydrological data from that area made an analysis of groundwater velocity, groundwater flow directions impossible to assess with any degree of certainty. So as we stand now, there's a very compelling need for a trans-frontier regional groundwater uh, study and assessment. Um, Anton, if we could please move ahead to the next slide, uh, where we also are seeing a significant problem and. Uh, Serena touched base with this earlier as well, is that uh, there's been an explosion of interest in uh, petroleum licenses. Uh, Recon have effectively paved the way now for, for regional exploration. You know, and despite the mounting concerns around uh, the challenges posed to ecosystems in that area, um, Recon Africa has effectively demonstrated uh, that there is little, you know, to uh, know governing kind of oversight and that the region is effectively open uh, for business. Um, you'll see in uh, the map on the left that uh, there's increasing onshore petroleum licenses in the northeast of Namibia, uh, predominantly around the Recon Africa um, lease areas. Uh, these uh, actually go all the way, uh, you know, they form the boundary with the Atosha Pan National Park and on the other side are extending up to the Kubango um, River to the north. Um, I think it should be pointed out that a number of the companies involved, not all, but a few of them are significantly more experienced and more credible than Recon Africa. So that's a, another worry um, for us to deal with. On the Botswana side, um, we've seen uh, mining groups uh, vying for uh, exploration licenses in an area directly adjacent to the Okavango Delta and even within the World Heritage Site buffer. Um, a company called the uh, Kihaba Resources, uh, it's a Canadian iron ore company, uh, recently commenced a litigation against the government of Botswana for failing to renew their exploration uh, license, despite the fact that it is within the World Heritage Site buffer. Uh, and then in December of 2023, uh, High Court, the High Court of Botswana ruled in favor of the company and ordered the Ministry of Mines to uh, renew their license so they're, they're back in business as well. This is, uh, you know, it, this isn't um, oil and gas, but, uh, you know, it, they have a potential for 440 million tons of iron ore and uh, the ground water risks there are just beyond, um, beyond considerable. I mean, iron ore and uranium mining um, have hugely negative impacts on groundwater as well as surface water, as well as you know, regional ecosystems and the health of uh, those human communities living in and around them. So thanks to Recon, we're now seeing that despite the huge risks and lack of any feasible groundwater studies, you know, a number of other companies are being given the green light to proceed with um, their exploration uh, operations and potentially with the uh, exploitation of resources within those areas. 
Um, which brings us on to the governing bodies. Anton, would you mind please moving on? Thanks very much. Um, so in terms of, of you know, conservation governance, it ultimately falls to you know, the governments of Botswana, Namibia, and Angola. However, in this case, the transfrontier nature of the conservation issue uh, means that uh, you know, we really need to start looking towards um, uh, those uh, alliances and international uh, organizations. Um, uh, for a kind of uh, way forward as such. Uh, I'd also like to just point out at this stage that, I mean, uh, you know, oil exploration is just one of the very many challenges being faced in that area uh, for the Okavango Delta in particular. Uh, you know, uh, there's um, uh, huge challenges with the uh, upstream developments and uh, clearing of the catchment area in Angola. Uh, agricultural runoff is another huge issue as well as uh, the potential for, for water abstraction. Um, what is interesting is that these other major challenges are, you know, steeped in, in social, socio-economic, um, you know, uh, patterns and, um, uh, you know, they, the challenges revolve around climate change, poverty reduction and, and access to water. And it's a very, very complex uh, challenge to, to confront, whereas oil drilling comparatively is a very easy issue as uh, you know it's it's generally only driven within this context by you know the economic gain by outside interests um so in terms of you know conservation governance this should be a very easy issue to to confront uh in terms of uh, the bodies that we have uh who could make a difference uh i think the first one worth mentioning is okacom that is the permanent okavango river basin commission uh, this was formed in 1995 between Angola, Botswana, and uh, Namibia. It's effectively an agreement that stipulates the joint monitoring and uh, resource planning of Okavango, of the Okavango Basin uh, waters, um, essentially in order to avoid any actions taken by any of the one, three countries that could affect the water resources of, of the others. Um, so in terms of... Um, oil drilling within uh, the Ocacom context. Uh, in July 2021, Ocacom, the Ocacom Council met to discuss uh, transboundary impacts of oil exploration. Uh, at that meeting, they agreed to permit prospecting, but only on, on the condition um, that the respective ministries of Botswana and Namibia would give complete oversight uh, of the proceedings, uh, that all regional stakeholders uh, would be consulted, and uh, perhaps most importantly within this context, that strict EIA regulations and guidelines would be followed. Uh, we now know that uh, Recon Africa did not follow very strict you know, EIA regulations. They, their uh, groundwater study showed that you know, there was a very, very low risk of uh, groundwater contamination. Our study, however, using the exact same data, shows a very high potential for groundwater contamination and a very high potential for that groundwater contamination to cross international boundaries. Uh, that being the case, this is a direct violation of uh, the Ocacom Council directives and uh, in complete contravention of uh, Ocacom's shared water resources agreement. Um, as such, I think it's uh, you know, fair to say that uh, the Ocacom advisory body needs to, to make an urgent intervention uh, as soon as possible. Uh, another group that we could look towards would be the uh, Kavango Zambezi uh, Transfrontier Conservation Area. Um, this was formed in 2012. It's known as Kaza uh, between Angola, Botswana, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and Namibia. It's one of the largest transfrontier conservation areas uh, on Earth at about half a million square kilometers. Um, uh, however, their main focus uh, has been to facilitate transboundary wildlife corridors, which is another challenge that we're facing and a very important one. Um, being that they are not currently a ratified conservation uh, or protected area means that they effectively lack the, the powers at the moment to protect groundwater transfrontier uh, resources. Um, However, what CASA could do uh, within this context would be to make recommendations to the governments of Botswana, Namibia, and Angola, uh, based on you know these extractives uh, companies operating within the borders of CASA and the fact that this runs completely against the greater um, CASA vision. Uh, then, lastly, we have uh, UNESCO, as I'm sure you're all aware. Um, the Okavango was granted uh, World Heritage Site status uh, over ten years ago. 
However, that status has come under scrutiny, scrutiny uh, recently, um, particularly at a World Heritage Sites uh, UNESCO conference in Riyadh in September last year, uh, where I believe that conference they even made calls to try and expand the buffer uh, to uh, well into Angola to include the headwaters and to protect that entire uh, upper catchment area and water tower. Uh, in November 2023, uh, new concerns were officially raised by uh, UNESCO and directed towards uh, the government of Botswana. Uh, they reiterated their utmost concern about oil and gas in the upstream areas of the Okavango, and they requested, well, they re-requested a strategic EIA to be conducted by the state parties of Angola, Namibia, and Botswana. Um, this EIA should correspond to international standards, require a groundwater study, and <clears throat> it would need to be submitted to UNESCO for review by the IUCN. Uh, UNESCO has given Botswana until the 1st of December of this year, 2024, to submit an updated um, report on the state of conservation of World Heritage Sites and an update on those specific points as well as others. Um, now we move on to, you know, future studies and our recommendations. Um, I think it goes without saying at this stage that uh, we strongly recommend that further transfrontier groundwater studies are urgently needed uh, to better understand the contamination risk to localized and uh, regional ecosystems um, uh, within the entire uh, area. Uh, we would recommend that uh, this study should be carried out by Okokom, uh, with the support of the Okokom uh, countries. And uh, that it should be as complex and as in-depth as possible, including chemical analysis of groundwater sediments, as well as use, use of um, piezometers to measure ground flow, direction, velocity, and pressure, traitor tests to calculate uh, contamination, directional flow, et cetera, all with the objective of putting together um, uh, a robust transfrontier groundwater model and a transfrontier groundwater contamination risk assessment. Um, we would strongly recommend that Recon Africa, neither Recon Africa nor any other uh, private entity uh, with personal interests uh, would be involved within that study. And we also highly recommend that until such a study um, is completed uh, to determine the risks of uh, contamination to groundwater, um, that uh, the Okokom states of Botswana, Angola, and Namibia uh, impose a strict moratorium on all oil and gas exploration in the Okavango River Basin, as well as uh, mining exploration in those areas adjacent uh, to the Okavango Delta. Um, so that's it from me. So thank you very much. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Masaveri for, uh, for hosting that as well. And uh, you know, thanks to my colleagues uh, for their support on this amazing uh, support and their amazing contributions to this project. Thank, um, thanks, Rory. And thanks to Surina and uh, Anton for the great presentation. So before we take, we go on to questions, um, let me quickly kind of recap what uh, the, the, their presentation or their study. So this study is, is motivated uh, by the um, prospective drilling uh, for gas or, or hydrocarbon or, or oil in, in Namibia and um, a potential drilling in Botswana. So they basically assess the risk of uh, contaminants on groundwater and um, they uh, demonstrated, I think uh, Surina gave an introduction on on hydrocarbons, how they are mined, and the potential uh, of each technique to contaminate both the surface and underground uh, water uh, resources. And then Anton gave us a, an overview of the geology of the area so that we can understand the risk and um, he also gave us a, a, a brief overview of the methods that they used and the, re, um, the results that they have uh, to demonstrate that there is a risk uh, to underground water 
resources. And then uh, Rory concluded by looking at um, governing bodies that are involved, how much they were involved um, when this uh, a prospective drilling was, um, licenses were, were, were issued and um, possibly uh, the recommendations that uh, this the, the study can can make is making uh, and the possible uh, bodies that the recommendations can be directed to so thank you very much for the for the for the presentation you know talking about geology um uh, geochemistry can be take uh, uh, you know technical but you 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 download you you done um What's the word? You tried your best to be to make it uh, interpretable to um, a wider audience, to a general audience. So thank you for the, for the efforts. So I'll uh, invite uh, questions. Feel free to raise your hand uh, if you have a question, and if you need a clarification on what they have uh, presented on. I'll start off with reading. Uh, questions that are on the chat. So Andy um, has a question. You may elaborate it if you want, Andy. And the question is, any monitoring of borehole network to detect contaminants? Are there any monitoring of borehole network to detect contaminants? Uh, hi, yeah, I just... Um thought you know with the exploration already happening um and you know with sort of water, contaminated water potentially going into the ground already is there scope to use your existing network of boreholes to see if contamination is already happening um from the exploratory work um yeah i'd be happy to answer that um no uh as far as uh you know we're concerned uh yeah it's it, this is an imperative that it should that should be happening um uh, Recon Africa did a test themselves um, two years ago. We're still waiting for the results um, as such. Um, uh, I believe Conservation International uh, were going to be undertaking uh, a test as well, but just close to one of the drill sites. Um, on uh, the personal side, I have spoken to community members in Namibia who complained that the taste of their borehole water has changed significantly and that it, that it tastes like soap. Like uh, like laundry detergent, um, but no, uh, no official studies have been conducted as of yet. Uh, I completely agree with you, Andy. I think it's it's important um, that it should be undertaken, but no, it hasn't happened yet. Thank you. Um, the second question is, what do you mean by uh, desktop and actual field research on case study? And this question is from Supia Luca. And and Luca, I see you have your your hand raised. You may um, feel free to elaborate on that question. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Sophia Luca from Masai Mara, Kenya. I'm an environmental teacher. So my concern is about I had in the conversation that you said about desktop um, more of research than the field research. That's one part of my question. The other one is that about the hydrocarbon, which is a non-renewable um, kind of a way. What's the concern about the zero emission, which is emission of 2020 or 2050 or globally for conservation? Uh, yeah, look, I could, I could answer the first part of that question and maybe leave the second one to Sorina. Um, so, you know, when I mentioned desktop studies, uh, essentially, uh, what happened with that EIA, as far as we understand it, was that uh, that EIA was completely composed of uh, publicly available data at the time. They effectively sat behind their desk, used uh, the very limited data that was available from that area to put together an environmental impact assessment that uh, at the end of the day claimed that there was no contamination risk, or for that matter, any risk to the, to the ecosystems whatsoever. So they never actually went out into the area to conduct any formal research on the ground uh, in that impact assessment. Um, uh, as for the future of hydrocarbon studies, I think that Serena is probably far better place to answer that. Um, yes, yeah, so future hydrocarbon studies would be really important. Um, 
the thing is, like Anton explained, that in the Gru Basin there is all the sand in the Kalori that covers the the area, and that we don't really have any information on the geology or the groundwater systems in this area. And it would be quite difficult to get information as well uh, when you look at approvals that has to be granted. Um, tracer tests might be a bit more complicated to get approvals for, but there are definitely uh, field studies that you can do to gather information. Already using some of the existing borals, some chemical monitoring can be done. Um, some additional information can be gleaned from groundwater borals uh, if, you, if the geological logs are available. So I think there's definitely scope to get a better understanding of what's going on. And if it would be allowed to drill any borals deeper into these systems to get more detailed geological information, we might get to a point where we can actually develop a model. I don't know if you mm -hmm. want to chip in there. No, that's yeah. that's perfectly correct. Thank you. Um, so you know, I I think I should take advantage of being the host. I see a hand uh, from the screen of Emily Costa. After my question, um, yours follows. So the Okavango is known for its um, high concentration of biodiversity. Um, suppose this uh, drilling is is um continuous and is 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 done in the Okavango area. What would be the risk to the freshwater biodiversity and the biodiversity in general? I know you you um, your study is more a uh, concerned with underground uh, water and you've provided evidence on that. But I mean you you can share your thoughts on on the um surface risk. Uh, yeah, so I, I think, oh, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, you I go just ahead. wanted to say, if you if you look at the um, physical, at the chemical pollution that might emanate from the oil and gas extraction, there is definitely a high risk of increased salinity or high saline water that may be released into the systems. And well, that's from a chemical point of view what I can say, but I think Rory, you'll have to explain a bit more about the biodiversity impacts of this. Yeah, thanks. I, I, I think from a biodiversity context, it's it, it's fairly simple that it would be, you know, uh, could potentially be hugely uh, catastrophic. Uh, you know, in terms of the just overall hydrology, uh, the Okavango Delta is the, the terminal sink of that entire river system. Once contamination gets in there, it's not going to get out, you know. So, you know, regardless of what risks and challenges are, I mean, it's, it's, it's going to be, you know, pretty, um, it's going to be irreversible once it happens. You know. uh, I'm sure uh, Dr. Masavedi knows, I, I mean, you know, the, the Okavango Delta, as it is, is one of the most fragile ecosystems that we that we have on the planet. The formation of the islands within the Delta is, uh, is hugely complex. And uh, I think according to studies by eminent hydrologists from the Okavango Research Institute, uh, you know, a number of those those uh, islands, uh, salt formations that formed around termite mounts, uh, you know, uh, millions of years ago. Now, the groundwater surface water interaction there, uh, if the salinity changes, you know, we could effectively lose a number of those islands and they just wash away, you know. And so that's the ecosystem already uh, facing some, some rather profound challenges. Um, and then, uh, you know, as for as for biodiversity, it's, it's, it's literally a question of, you know, who drinks the water you know, and uh, mm. who's going to want to drink contaminated water. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, um, uh, Sir, um, um, I see the hand on uh, Emily. I d I'm not sure if you're Emily yourself, so mm -hmm. you, you can go ahead. <laughs> uh, it's, hi, Richard, it's Emlyn Costa, hello. Um, yeah. I'm a geologist and I apologize, I couldn't make the main part of the lecture, but. Um, I think my comment might be uh, related to the discussion I've already heard. Um, so this, I just want to uh, sort of briefly mention that the, the body of research, which is rapidly growing on the environmental impacts of the Earth's surface of subsurface drilling exploration, um, uh, whether it's for hydrocarbons or whether it's, uh, it's uh, surface sources of pollution that make their way into groundwater, and come back up to the surface to do great harm 
um, that, that there is a, a big dis distinction between um, the fracking effects and the deeper drilling effects, more traditional drilling. But what I want to just um, uh, urge you all to, um, to the degree to which you may not, I'm sorry, I don't know your knowledge about this, is the, the long-term effects, which do not become apparent for decades or much longer. And I'm going to point you all to a readily accessible film that is a legal thriller that tells the true story of an attorney in uh, Philadelphia who um, represented farmers, um, owners of livestock, as well as residents in the area surrounding DuPont's factory in uh, Wilmington, Delaware. Uh, this is film, a film called Dark Waters. I recommend it as distinguished from a film called Dark Water, which is not to do with the same thing at all. Dark Waters, plural, readily available on Netflix. Um, you will, uh, I think, learn a great deal if you don't know this area already from the, the persistence that one has to take to challenge uh, the sources of pollution. In this case, maybe in, in what you're talking about, this would be oil and gas exploration companies. But the, the, the concern I'm raising is the long-term multi-decadal, and maybe if we live long enough, multi-century impacts of that, that keep on polluting and harming not just human health, but in the case of the Dark Waters film, uh, agricultural animal livestock health. And so when you're talking about an area like the Delta in, in Botswana, you know, the, 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 uh, it, the, monitor, the, the effects on wildlife uh, in drinking water can also be profound. And so this is what I just want to draw to your attention is uh, to learn from, uh, I think, analogous circumstances in other geographies and in other repercussions of, of uh, careless or willful or ignorant efforts by industry to uh, put under high pressure fluids into the ground, which end up coming back to pollute groundwater and also surface waters, as shown in the film Dark Waters. Thank you, Emily. Um, I think we will uh, watch Dark Waters and um, thank you about, um, thank you for showing or sharing the long-term effects that could uh, possibly happen uh, because of um, taking fluids from underground and putting them on the surface. So yeah, I, I have another question myself because I don't see a question uh, a hand yet. So in my view, the the prospective drilling um it's 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 for money. It's for money. The company is looking for money. So uh, and and uh, it involves politicians, it involves leaders who who may not be uh, signed who are not scientists. So it will take um, evidence, you know, to take them, you know, out of the idea of possibly accessing some money from, from drilling. So uh, to demonstrate, to show the risk uh, of possible migration of water and pollutants from the drilling point to the Okavango system you 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 indicated that it may take eight years it may take as short as eight eight years or three years or it may take a couple of years how did you calculate that because it, it will need co to convince uh, that there is a risk because it may seem like the the boreholes or the drilling points are far from the system and um therefore they are isolated uh, so i think Maybe you can share, you may have explained it in the methods, but you may want to share it again so that it, it, it's um, more, you know, uh, how do I put it, more uh, explained. <laughs> yeah. yeah understandable. Um, yeah, so... These calculations were based on the type of data we had available. So we used hydraulic conductivity values in the case of the upper weathered aquifer and 
the piezometric surface to estimate what the travel times would be in that case. Um, in terms of next to the dolerite dikes and the faults, that is using a constant velocity value over a set distance. We are assuming in that case that we've got a more or less continuous fracture system that links the prospecting areas and the delta. And we have got uh, a more or less constant velocity of water moving inside of it. And based on that, for a fracture system, we can see it taking 10 years to reach the delta, or it could take four days as, as, the, as the shortest time. Uh, in the porous aquifers, the, 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 the shallow aquifer, the time is, of course, a bit slower because it's porous, it's going by a VR, a Darcy velocity. So uh, it takes a tiny bit longer there, in that case, anything from three years up until so 30 years. So that's essentially how we calculated it. It was based on the location to the nearest um, surface water sink or area where it's to go to. And then we use, in the case of the shallow aquifer, the hydraulic conductivity and the prismetric surface. And for the um, fracture system, we used constant values from literature and estimated over a distance. Okay, thank you. Are there any case studies that you can use to, you know, no. as examples? Okay. Now, sadly, there's very, very little research done, particularly on groundwater in this area. Uh, Partly because like the, the wells that you get are generally hand dug. It's very hard to get a drill machine into that area. So you generally have hand dug wells that are relatively shallow and that severely limits the amount of information and these type of studies that one could do. Thank you very much. Kinsley Adindu. Hello everybody. I am Kingsley and I'm um, joined this call from Port Harcourt, Nigeria, um, in the Niger Delta of um, uh, Nigeria, where you have a lot of oil exploration activities. I'm currently um, an early career researcher from, with the University of Port Harcourt, and um, my interest is in um, mangrove con con conservation. I um, have actually enjoyed uh, every part of the um, call today and I appreciate all the speakers but I just want to ask um, how do we uh, I mean I'm coming from a place where you have a like you have widespread um, pollution from um, oil exploration and it's been there for decades in fact from the inception of oil exploration in this part of the world and of course, there are many factors that affect this. But I just want to really ask, because I, I've been asking this question um, during conversations um, within the academia and, and, and um, research community. How do we get the local people, you know, how do we interpret all this conversation? How do we communicate it um, to non-researchers, um, local people, for them to really understand? Because um, from my observation and some research, uh, researches um, um, I've, I've been part of, some of the effects of, for example, hydrocarbon pollution in, um, in um, coastal communities, which is basically um, what we have mostly in the Niger Delta area of um, Nigeria. The effects of hydrocarbon pollution sometimes is interpreted within traditional context, within cultural context. So people don't really know what's going on. And when you try to communicate this, there's like a barrier where there's an extent to how much you can say, because um, explaining this thing to people who don't maybe even understand English is a very big problem. And for us to actually you know, tackle environment, this environmental pollution of hydrocarbon, I believe to a large extent, um, local people must be involved because sometimes they are in this part ignorantly involved in sabotage, which, you know, still impacts them. So how do we bring all this conversation within the grassroots to really help those people who are directly impacted by hydrocarbon pollution? Thank you. 
Perhaps I can jump in there, Kingsley. What a wonderful uh, question and what a wonderful context. And I completely agree. Uh, the most important uh, way forward is getting communities involved and uh, educating communities around the real risks of uh, you know, oil and gas uh, and what the what the benefits will actually be. Um, you know, in Botswana, in that Recon Africa area, for example, um, there are about four or five communities who are probably the some of the, the most impoverished communities in, in Botswana. So when you get a, an oil company coming in there and, uh, you know, promising the world, you know, um, it's a very easy, easy lie to believe, you know. At the end of the day, you know, I... I would ask the communities, it's like, you know, ask them for at least one, just one example, one example from anywhere in the world where a community, a local community has benefited from oil and gas exploration in the long term, in the long term, you know, uh, wow. it can't be, it can't be over the short term, you know, and, um, and you can see, you know, when you, when, when these questions are asked, it's, you know, it, it, it makes more sense. I think a big Part of the problem, as you as you mentioned, it's it's it, it's potentially not only a, an issue of language; it's also one of bringing local communities out of a very traditional structure and expecting them to be able to maneuver themselves in the modern kind of uh, world, which is the same world that these these oil drilling companies are, are operating in. So. It's it has to be one of of education as far as uh, as far as I'm you know as far as I'm concerned uh, you know and it 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 has to be taken slowly it, it can't be thrown on them in 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 any rapid uh, rapid movement uh, and sustainability and long term benefits for these communities are going to take time uh, there's no quick fix uh, I remember speaking to one of the communities who'd been visited by um, a recon representative in Botswana. Uh, uh, he was saying that uh, they, you know, they promised him a vehicle once they were finished drilling. They were going to leave all of the land cruisers behind, you know, and so that would be free use for the community. And it's these kind of promises that just inflate and aggravate the the, the overall issue because that's never going to happen. At the end of the day, these communities are going to be so much worse off. Um, and uh, you know, beyond the fact that you know their traditional culture and way of life is already under threat, bringing in oil production into that area is going to destroy that way of life already. And I think the more apparent we make that to these communities, the easier it will be for them to understand the, the dangers and challenges that, that are faced. But uh, no, I'm really glad that you're on this call because you know I think for us, uh, looking towards the, the Niger Delta is, a, is an amazing example of, you know, um, of what could we we of what we could potentially expect to happen within the Okavango Delta, and uh, I think uh, you know <clears throat> there have been cases I haven't you know I I've, I've read about of um, community members in Namibia actually being taken to the Okavango uh, to the the Niger Delta um, in order to to view firsthand uh, what could be expected. Thank you very much for the the answer and uh, the very uh, um, intriguing um, question because we you know engaging the the public or the local community it's a very important thing in every project without without the public the local uh, public, supporting the project, the local leadership supporting the project or the cause, it is often uh, difficult. So communicating science to them, um, especially with underground water movement and so on, um, it can be challenging. So I think a scientist will have to think about the, the continually think about how to tone down the scientific evidence and may communicate it in a more, um, you know, a absorbable um, home. And so it's a challenge for, for many uh, science fields, especially those which become a bit specific. 
but I guess it's something that we continue to think about. So there was a question from, um, uh, is it Sophia on, on carbon footprint? Um, you wanted, you, you said something about the carbon footprint of the project. Was that a, is that, is that a question you want to follow up on? Yeah, thank you very much, Richard. Um, uh, about carbon footprint calculator, which is a simple way of not, like knowing how the pollution of hydrocarbon is getting to the environment was my simple question that can it be like giving us a, a brief about, did they do anything about the carbon footprint to the environment? Thank you. That was my question. Thank um, you. Rory, I don't know if you know if there was any carbon calculations in terms of the carbon footprint or the extent no, of possible impact that, on the equality. Uh, no, not that I know of. Um, only that there's very little need for any new um, hydrocarbon extraction or any new hydrocarbon exploration to be taking place. We have enough. We have enough resources as it is. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, because the apart from the groundwater impact, the air quality impact is also quite significant. If you look at, um, especially shale gas and coal bed methane extraction, I mean, a lot of in America, a lot of the shale gas is developed um, without being able to capture it into pipelines, and a lot of this methane is then fled into the atmosphere which also increases um, the, the carbon footprint and the effect of coal bed um, and shale gas extraction on the atmosphere and on climate change. So it is a significant concern as well. Any more questions? Okay, without uh, more questions, any more questions? I think uh, I just have to say something about this talk and then uh, maybe we can conclude. So I wish there were many, I tried to share the link, but I don't see many scientists from Botswana. Your, your study is really important. I'm really happy to be part of this session and to to uh, you know know about your study uh, from you and uh, i think i mentioned to you that we i and my colleague we collected sediments from the delta uh, to see how uh, egg banks in floodplains might be uh, impacted by increased salinity from a you know po possible uh, a deposition if i may say of liquids uh, from drilling if it happens and i think they, there is need for more studies so that the scientific findings are comprehensive and they tell one strong story so I think uh, uh, since the, the, this talk is going online, maybe we will have more studies, um, you know, uh, around this subject uh, now uh, happening. So thank you very much for, for this uh, important talk. And uh, I think without uh, further questions, uh, we will uh, close the the meeting and we can have one more round okay so uh i think johan has his uh, hand raised johan go ahead richard we would just like to on behalf of um leadership for conservation in africa just thank you for hosting the session we really appreciate your time um to have a actual expert on the subject to, to come in and, and facilitate it really meant a lot to us 
and then also to the team. Um, it takes a lot of time to prepare a presentation like this. They literally have been working on this since last year. Um, and several meetings and working on, on really taking our advice into account um, in terms of streamlining the message so it's understandable and, and, and easily uh, um, consumable by the public. So we really appreciate your time and your effort, all three of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and it's to my presenters. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Fabio. Good. Good to be back with the Unlocking community. It, we look forward to seeing you again next week.